Thank you for joining us today as we gather for worship. Aaron will start us with a few uh, uh, minutes of opening music. Good morning, Aaron. Oh. Morning, Kirk. Uh, this is, I, I've lost track of how many Sundays we've spent together this way, but um, I'm going to start by playing a, a, a Heiferdahl, it's a, a hymn tune. Um, the song is called Alleluia, Sing to Jesus. And uh, a few more, uh, they'll know we are Christians by our love, and then we'll, we'll talk after that. <laughs>
So uh, this piece is a is a piece called God Leads Us Along. Uh, you can look up those lyrics and Landon's providing some helpful notes in our comment section if you wanted to uh, to look through that to give some information about um, the piece itself. Um, and then I'll finish with uh, an arrangement of God is So Good, which is familiar <laughs> tune. <laughs> Thank you. 
Christ is risen. I said that once. I thought I was muted, but I'm not. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Welcome, my friends, to our Sunday service at the Kirk of Kansas City. We're so glad that you have joined us today. I'm Chad Herring, and I'm the pastor of the Kirk. We are a Christian community uh, seeking to follow God on the way of Jesus Christ and part of the Presbyterian Church USA. If you're new to us, you will find that we are a church that seeks to build community and to love and serve our neighbors. We aspire to be guided by an inclusive theology, a welcoming spirit, and a commitment to seeking after peace and justice in the world. If you are familiar with Protestant worship services, much of this will be comfortable. But if this is new to you, don't worry. I'll walk you through it as we go. We're broadcasting today on Zoom and on Facebook Live. A little bit later today, we'll be uploading the video to our website so that others can also watch later. One benefit for joining us live is that you can use the chat feature to check in with us and with others who are watching. Um, you can, uh, a little bit later in the service, we'll have a moment for sharing prayer requests uh, with us. We ask that you get those prayer requests in early, particularly if you're on Facebook, because there is a little bit of a lag. If you're on Zoom, please note that you can choose whether to send the chat to the worship team, Zoom calls those panelists, or to everyone, those panelists and attendees. Because this is a public gathering, we have some volunteers that are uh, in our chat rooms helping monitor everything. While we hope we don't have any Zoom bombers, we will all do the best we can to worship with a spirit of grace. Uh, you can learn more about our church on our uh, online. Uh, we are at, uh, we are at uh, uh, on Facebook at caseykirk.org. I'm so sorry. We are on, uh, I'm having some technical difficulty here this morning. Let's try that again. Okay. My screen went blank for a second, friends. That's always interesting. Um, you can learn more about our church at our website, kckirk.org, or on our Facebook page, look for the Kirk of KC. We're also on Twitter and Instagram as well. We encourage you to like and follow our social media accounts. That's how we will communicate with everyone about our activities during this time of quarantine. For example, we have a weekly Bible study that you can join, or you can hear about our service team's invitation to help with making sack lunches for distribution for the hungry clients of Cherith Brook. That's a Presbyterian Catholic worker house at 12th and Benton. The service team is also working on a non-perishable food drive, maybe for next weekend. Uh, keep an eye out for that announcement. We'll also be using these social media accounts to invite everyone to our next uh, GEM dinner series event. That will be at 6.30 on Friday, May 1st. It'll be a Zoom gathering where we'll have some fun social time together. So you can stay informed by liking and following our social media accounts or through our church-wide email. If you'd like to be on our email list, send me a note. Uh, I'm at chat at caseykirk.org. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Insta. One additional thing to share this morning, our youth are getting together for a youth group Zoom tonight at four o'clock this afternoon. Z uh, Mitch sent out a note to families and youth about this uh, gathering over the weekend, and we hope that you can join us for that activity. If you didn't get the note, let me know, and I will get you connected. Now that we're done with these announcements, we can get started. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let's worship together. We will begin with some prayer to center us, to connect us to one another. First, a call to worship, and then a prayer of affirmation. My daughters, Nora and Tessa, are going to join us and lead us in our gathering prayer. Hi, Nora and Tessa. Come join me. I invite you to join us as we begin with the reading of our call to worship. Please join us. Let's pray. Come, children of God, to sing a new song. Clap your hands and shout for joy. Jesus is our good news, our joy, and our salvation. In steadfast love and faithfulness, God has done marvelous things. God raised Jesus from the dead. Christ is alive and at work among us. God hears our prayers and answers when we call. God makes us dwell in safety and puts joy into our hearts. Celebration for all God has done. Let us worship God together. Thank you, ladies. Next, uh, Mitch Phillips will greet us and will lead us all in a prayer of affirmation. Hi, Mitch. Good morning, Kirk. How is everyone doing today? It's beautiful outside and it's a beautiful indoor way to worship together as we are here this morning. We begin worship, let us pray. 
New every morning is your mercy, O God. Your faithfulness is as boundless as the heavens. We gather to worship you, thankful for all your gifts. We rejoice that Jesus, in dying and rising for us, has forever overcome the power that sin and death and hopelessness and anxiety have over our lives. Grant us the ability to fully, fully, fully accept the freedom Christ offers us through your presence among us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mitch. I'm glad to introduce our special music for the day. This is a song called Come People of the Risen King with Aaron Bates Kemp and Ethan Platt. First scripture reading today is from the Acts of the Apostles. Mitch will lead us in that reading. Hi, Mitch. Good morning again. 
the scripture reading is right after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and Peter is finally living out his nickname sake, The Rock, as he stands before and tells people of the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please join me as we read Acts 2, 14, 36 through 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them saying, save yourself from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Mitch. We continue our sermon series called Because He Lives, There's Hope for You. All of our readings during this season of Easter ask us to reflect together about what impact the empty tomb has for our lives and for the world. Today's reading is a story about Jesus's appearance recounted in the gospel according to Luke. And I invite you to listen and to ponder these words from Holy Scripture. Now, on that same day, Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and, and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and, and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women in our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had seen indeed a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us. Because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scripture to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to, to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. 
And may God bless our reading and our understanding and our applying of these words to how we live our lives. Amen. The BBC News published an article on Wednesday of this last week with a title that seemed to call out to me with a kind of deep understanding and keen insight that makes me wonder if they're reading my journal or if they can hear the voices in my head. The reason Zoom calls drain your energy, the BBC title declared. I realize the irony about bringing this up since we're all using Zoom to worship right now. We like Zoom for worship because it is generally easy to use, because people who don't use the internet very much can call into it, because it connects most of the time to Facebook, and it allows us to bring worship to you while those of us leading worship are in different locations. It is a true marvel of modern technology. We don't think that Zoom drains our energies during this hour. This is a bit different. Worship via Zoom might be work for those of us who lead it, but for all of us, it is rejuvenating, joyous time together. This isn't the same as meeting using Zoom where there is work work to do. It's, it's that sort of time, the, the schedule a call, have an agenda to work through, get the whole team online and, and let's get the meeting done sort of gathering that the BBC is seeking to explain in that article. And they have a point. Some of you might be retired or doing work that doesn't require meetings or, or maybe even you're out of work and would be delighted to have a Zoom meeting right about now. But for many others, including myself, work in the age of coronavirus means getting accustomed to teleconferencing software like Zoom. Millions of students and employees have all of a sudden found themselves to be on these platforms all the time. We use Zoom for a lot of our meetings too, and for our Bible studies, which is fine, but it can also feel like a lot. One day last week, I had six Zoom meetings lasting a total of at least six hours. And I'm not complaining. I am truly grateful for the technology that allows many of us to work from home. Without it, this economic slump that we're in could be a lot worse. Though we know that it only helps those of us who work in careers where we meet a lot. You can't Zoom that leaky faucet repair if you're a plumber. You can't go to meeting the restocking of the grocery store shelves or WebEx the intubation of your next patient. So this is all relative for sure, but, but the BBC article did touch a nerve. If you're spending a lot more time on video teleconferencing like me, you might be wondering why you feel so exhausted at the end of the day. Well, the BBC says that's because of all the extra work we have to do in these sorts of meetings. Our bodies and our minds are not built for processing our human to human interaction through a screen. We are, as Aristotle once called us, social, rational animals. And being with other people is part of who we are, social animals. So we human beings are finely tuned in just such a way that we can read the so-called nonverbal communication of others, the subtle raising of an eyebrow, uh, when we hear something incredulous, you know, the barely perceptible wrinkle near the lips when we think we're onto something, the, the slightly audible inhalation when we're shocked, but we don't want other people to know it. These are the things that don't translate very well unless you're actually with other people, or so says the BBC. But you learn a lot of this in an introduction to psychology course in college also. This sort of nonverbal communication happens naturally, often subconsciously when we're together. And there's something therefore that's lost with many other forms of communication. The telephone, you can hear some important nonverbals, but you might miss the furrowed brow or the silent laughter. Text or email, well, emojis can help, but they're not always appropriate when you're writing your boss. And how many times have we read something in an email or a text that totally missed what the other person was saying? Snapchats and Instas and Facebook messages and yes, teleconferencing software, maybe some opportunity to get the broader picture through video and pictures, right? But this is the point. Your mind has to work a lot harder when you're trying to do it. The BBC says that we tend to ramp up our attention span during these efforts at uh, communication. Um, and looking for those nonverbal cues that would naturally be so apparent if we were just sitting right here. Then <laughs> there are those moments of silence. 
right? Normal in a face-to-face -face discussion where someone might be reflecting on what we're just talking about or someone might be trying to fix the tech problem on their screen. It just seems so unnatural over teleconference and people leap in to try to fill the void. These are the kind of things that can exhaust us. To make it better, the article advises, space out your calls, take breaks, connect to real people. <laughs> All really sound ideas, right? Ideas that can often be in tension with the work that we still have to get done. And with this ever bizarre and stressful time that we're in, where we're all at home alone together. During my Zoom calls uh, this week, some of them, we've been talking with people about how we seem to be hitting a sort of rhythm where sure, we might be having, having some trouble remembering just exactly what day of the week it is because we're all in our houses all of the time, but maybe we've got the basics figured out by now. We have a plan for all of the essential things. We know how to go to the grocery store. You know, my mask is in my car along with my hand sanitizer. I'm sure to take my list so that I can be efficient and get out of there in minimal time. So beyond the boredom and the ennui and the anxiety about our loved ones and our jobs, Many of us are making it through our days okay. Sure, we're eager to get back to the way things were. We're just not sure when that's going to be. But it helps us to remember that none of this is normal, you know? Zoom calls might help us uh, do some of our work, but, but they're exhausting. If you're in more of a manual labor type situation, or if you work at a bank, or if you're a chaplain or a nurse, there are so many new things that we're dealing with that the stress can really build up for all of us, even if we're not able to name its presence all the time. These are wild and chaotic days. And even if we're seeking ways to order it, to make it manageable and understandable, it is okay to just feel completely overwhelmed and spent. We miss our families. We miss our friends. We miss going out and just being with people at the movies or at a restaurant or at an art fair or at a baseball game. This story, Jesus's resurrection appearance on the road to Emmaus found in the gospel according to Luke has some of the same features, I think, as to what we're feeling these days. It's, it's not all the same. No two tragedies are ever the same, but there are some important resonances here. Easter was three weeks ago, but since then we've been exploring these stories that all happen on the same Easter day. Last week, we talked about the disciples, right? Locked in their safe houses, quarantined and isolated because of their fear of the religious authorities. That story began on the very morning that Mary found the tomb empty, Easter morning. So too, this reading from Luke, where the very same day, two of his followers are heading back home. It is the road to Emmaus, not that far away, just seven miles or so, a long but comfortable walk, but they're preoccupied distressed along the way. And I think we can all understand why. The death of Jesus was a deeply tumultuous event. This teacher that they had followed for years, their friend, their leader, they, they loved him. They believed in his cause. They felt through him something that was new and, and different, acceptance for so many I mean, those stories about the blind gaining sight and the lepers being healed are as much about welcome and acceptance for people outcast by society as they are about the actual physical healing. A call to help feed the hungry and serve the hurting. The promise of God's presence and love through our difficult moments. They felt through Jesus something that was so new and different and life-giving, and now it was gone. Well, it felt like it was gone. They, they sure thought it was gone. Jesus is dead. So they are heading home, feeling sad. They came across a stranger who must have picked up on something in their demeanor, nonverbals, maybe. Sometimes our body language speaks louder than words ever can. And he asked them, what are you all talking about over there? And they can't believe it. Uh, it may be like someone asking me at the grocery store, so, so hey, what's that mask all about anyway? Why are you carrying around Purell in your pocket? So I'm sure they shot the stranger a look. You could probably see it in Cleopas's eyes, you know, incredulous. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there? Really? 
And with that, they start telling him about their Jesus, a prophet mighty in word and in deed, that they had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem all of Israel. But alas, there is so much chaos right now. Some women in our group went to go tend to his body. He wasn't there. Others went to go check it out. No luck. We are all so shook. And the stranger, uh, clued in now, jabs them a little bit and starts to connect all of these things with the ancient prophecies and, and with Jesus's own teaching, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. He interpreted to them, to them the things about himself and all the scripture, says Luke. And apparently that was so engrossing, so mesmerizing that it took up the rest of that seven mile walk right? They get to the Emmaus stop and the stranger intends to go on. Won't you stay with us? It's late. Let's get some food. You can head on tomorrow. And he does. And then they're at a table and he takes a loaf of bread, gives thanks for it, breaks it and gives it to them. It might be helpful to understand that these disciples, all of them, Cleopas and his unnamed companion, those back in Jerusalem locked in a room, a all of the others, wherever they are, maybe like Thomas out doing whatever it is he needs to do in that moment, all of them are in that same sort of place where they're just trying to keep it all together, you know? Their whole world has been torn asunder. The deck just got reshuffled. We might have some compassion for them. None of this is normal. They're working hard to make it through the day and aren't quite sure what tomorrow will bring. And boy, does that sound familiar sometimes. Where are Cleopas and his companion going? One tradition holds that they're heading back home. Maybe they'll get back to fishing or if that's what it was that they had done before or baking or carpentry, whatever, they're heading back. This time with Jesus, it fizzled out. It was done. We took a risk. We left what little we had. It didn't work out. No wonder they were sad. Until that moment that Jesus changed all of that. Not so much through the lengthy and I'm quite sure erudite explanation of everything on the road, but later when they shared the same sort of meal that Jesus had shared with them before, take, bless, break, give. The amazing power of sacramental food and they see that it is Jesus with them the women at the tomb were right. Christ is risen. He is actually risen. It is you, Jesus. And then he is gone. And they look at each other and they say, we're not our hearts burning inside of us back there on the road. And now we have seen him in the breaking of the bread. Maybe, maybe Peter is good enough at explaining all the details to get 3,000 people to believe. But for Jesus, it is a much more intimate encounter. Last week, he invited Thomas to touch the holes in his hands and his side. And today, he is there at the table. This one who was once the stranger is now the host, feeding the disciples with more than just bread, but with a hope and a vision of something new that will sustain them their whole lives long. They ran back that very night, all seven miles back to Jerusalem. They didn't wait for the sun to rise again to go tell and to go and tell the others. But the others have had their own risen, I mean, their own experience of the risen Jesus too. Simon saw him, Christ, Christ is risen. And, and just like that, a new dawn would arise. There's a lot I love in this story, but maybe the most important thing is to note how none of it would have happened if Cleopas and the other disciple hadn't learned something from all that time that they had spent with Jesus. If they had just said goodbye as the stranger was heading on down the road, if they had not opened their heart to an opportunity to share some hospitality at that moment, if they had decided that they were just gonna go continue being sad by themselves, this moment of awareness and possibility would have been missed. As it was, it was their expression of compassion and welcome that set the table for the holy meal, where their eyes were open and their hearts were set ablaze. Maybe that's the word for us to hold on to on a day like today, that, that it is through our acts of care and love and connection with others, even through Zoom, even at a distance, that it's through our acts of care and love and connection with others 
that the very presence of God might be seen and known and alive among us. So when we share the food we have, when we're attentive to the needs of others, when we allow ourselves to reframe our hopelessness within God's larger story, there we might see God alive in our risen Lord. So may we know that our God can take our most chaotic moments and surprise us in all sorts of ways through erudite reason and passionate explanations and through the humble, caring, mundane thing, something like the breaking of some bread and knowing that God can do this, may we keep our eyes open a little more for it each and every day. And maybe our own hearts will burn with God's passion, a sense that God will be with us. And together, we will not only make it through, but we will help make it all better. May it be so. Amen. After the sermon, uh, we're glad to share a hymn as a way for us to reflect on the message for the day. Today's hymn is Open My Eyes That I May See. You can either watch and enjoy, or if you'd like, you can sing along at home with the words on the screen. Worship service always includes a moment of thanksgiving, where we make note of God's, God's many gifts in our lives, how even when we struggle to make sense of a perilous world, we can be thankful for so much, and we pledge ourselves not to take any of it for granted, but to return these gifts to God and to reinvest them in other people. One way that we can understand the life of faith is that it's more like a journey than a settled place. We have hills and valleys, and that Jesus often meets us along the way. How will we respond when we see Jesus? Can we give back as Jesus does, loving one another, cultivating meaningful lives, working so that others can have safe and healthy lives too? The natural response to God's amazing gifts is to adopt a similar generous spirit, to respond to the needs of others who are hurting, to share our resources and work to build communities of justice and welcome. There are many good people doing important work in your neighborhood. So look for them 
and support them in that work. If you'd like to join us in this effort, check us out at kckirk.org. We'd be delighted to have you work with us too. Think about how you can be Christ's hands and feet this very day. And so we offer a prayer of thanksgiving today. Please join me in prayer. We give thanks, gracious God, for the joy of giving so that your grace may abound, your love may flourish, and your way may be pursued. May others find refreshment and wholeness through our sharing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to move to a time of community prayer. I'm going to lift up some prayer concerns that are specific for our church community. And if you're watching and you don't know these people, that's okay. Send your best thoughts along anyway. If you're online now, we encourage you to send any prayer requests you have in, and we will try to share them too at the end of the list that I have. I'll end each prayer request with the words, O Lord, and you can finish at home with the phrase, hear our prayer. O Lord, hear our prayers. We start with general prayers for our common anxiety during this time of social disruption for first responders, medical professionals, caregivers everywhere, for, for people who are struggling with boredom or loneliness or anxiety about their loved ones and unable who are unable to see them, be with them, for people who are getting groceries for their homebound neighbors, for everyone who has to wait for surgical procedures, for parents worried about their kids or kids their parents, for all of us thinking about our friends and our neighbors, we pray that God's calm and compassion might be with each one of us. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those we know who are particularly impacted by COVID-19 or who are sick with something that could be related to the coronavirus. Ongoing prayers for John and Georgia Tucker's granddaughter, Blakely Thomas, uh, the friend of the Kirk, former pastor of Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church that we've been praying for the last couple of weeks, Jay McKell. He's now out of the hospital and in a recovery unit. We're grateful for that news. We pray for comfort and for healing for all of these people and for others wherever it is possible. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for loved ones and friends who are serving in the military on deployment, who are delayed in returning home. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. We continue to pray for Doug Hodeck's father, Dennis Hodeck. He continues to battle cancer. We offer prayers for peace and comfort for Dennis. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. Along with Bob and Kaki Williams, we pray for the family and friends of Kim Logan Drell, Bob's niece. Uh, she died on April the 20th. We give thanks for her life and we mourn her passing. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. Pat Calloway has asked for prayers for the family and friends of a friend of his, Frank Rieger, died this past week. We also heard this week about the passing of the Reverend Tom Schroeder. He's a retired ELCA pastor, Lutheran pastor. He died as a pedestrian in a car accident near the Kirk last week. We pray prayers of comfort and compassion for those who miss these good people, and we lift them up to the care and the love of God. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. We also lift up others who've been regular people in our prayer life as a church. Uh, Eva Kuntz, Lee Petty, Jim Mullen, Don Ladwig, Wendy Nielsen, Bill Killam, Martha Moss, Ralph and Eileen Mitchell, Scott Stewart, Marjorie Langford, Jan Bays, Cheryl Huter, Don Daniels, Madigan Brown, Jill and Vance. We pray for the family of Marcia and Franta, the family of Mary Schraff. We pray for the people of the Cameroon, and we pray for the Kirk, that God may find a way to knit us together, even during this time of physical distancing. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. Let me see what prayers are in our chat room today. Um, just a moment. Um, we pray today for Mike Duckett, uh, who is fighting cancer. That's a prayer from John and Georgia Tucker. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the friend, for David Mitchell's friends, Marshall and Sarah in Connecticut. They have lost six friends, colleagues, and patients. Uh, we pray for uh, them, uh, for the loss, um, and for God's presence to be with them today. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. Allie Decker asks for prayers for uh, her friend, Burma, whose husband, Eric, has a terminal diagnosis with only a few months to live. We pray for Eric and Burma, that God's comfort and God's passion and God's love may be with them during these months. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. Um, Pat Calloway lifts up uh, not just Frank Rieger, but also Martha, the surviving spouse uh, of Frank, um, and we pray for her this day. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. One more moment to check to see if there's anything else on the Facebook thread. Landon doesn't see anything there. Okay. 
with these prayers and the prayers that we all say in our own lives and in our own hearts, I invite you to turn to God, turn with me in the spirit of prayer. Let's pray together. Gracious God, you are alive and we rejoice. You are alive and so we can live again. You are alive and you set us free from worry and fear and death and anxiety. You are alive. Alleluia. Yet we are still beset all around us by fear and worry and death and anxiety. And so we gather today as your people, thankful for your love that has given us purpose and meaning. Hear our prayers of intercession and concern that you might strengthen us for living as your Easter people in this world that you created and redeemed and love. We pray for those around us, O oh, caring God particularly those who struggle or who suffer today, those who are in need for, of food or shelter or medical care, those who struggle to find good work, those who mourn loved ones who have died, whom we will miss terribly, all who struggle with nurturing healthy relationships with parents or partners or kids, people weary and bone tired with staying at home, people unable to connect in person with loved ones. Comfort us, we pray, with your love and with your welcome. Help us to offer your calming presence to all others that we encounter along the way. We pray this morning for those who are ill or hurting, who are seeking wholeness of body or mind or spirit, and in particular, those we love who are receiving treatment for all sorts of medical conditions, from chronic conditions like cancer or heart disease or diabetes or Parkinson's. We pray for children everywhere, your children everywhere who are living with HIV AIDS, those with dementia and their caregivers, those working through depression and mental illness. In all things, O oh God of hope and healing, help us to rest our finite and fragile bodies in the infinite and boundless love you have for each of us. We pray today for this world. We pray for leaders who seek to do the right, who shoulder great responsibility. We pray for those uh, first responders and medical professionals and health workers and therapists. We pray today for insight and patience as together we struggle against COVID-19. And we continue to pray for peace in our world and pray for those who respond to this global crisis. Help us to advance the cause of peace and harmony in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and in the world. We pray for anyone today who wishes to do us harm. In your love and in your wisdom, guide us, we pray, O Prince of Peace. We thank you today for this chance to ground ourselves, if only for a few moments, in this gathering of your people, as we join with so many others around the world who are grateful for your care in our lives. We give you thanks for moments of peace, of laughter, of hope, of strength, of courage. Nurture these in our lives that we might share them with the world. We offer you today this prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who shows us how to love because he is the very love of God. We pray this prayer in his name and say together the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Dear friends, Christ is risen and the whole world is new again. That first Easter wasn't met with trumpets and fanfare. It was a haphazard, disorderly, imperfect affair with a lot of confusion about what was happening and what would happen tomorrow or the next day. So too for us, this season of Easter, things are a lot less orderly, a lot more chaotic, so confusing. But the Easter gospel is this. Christ is alive. Something new is afoot. God can give us hope even during times such as this. And so before we close with our charge and our benediction, let me invite you to join us at the Kirk as we continue to find new ways of being God's people together. We will be here again next Sunday for worship, and we would love to have you join us. Now, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be yours forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great Sunday. Bye, friends.